good evening to all of you. So to start with tonight, we would like to uh, use the first uh, 10 minutes, to just a quick brush up on cost structure before we go back and do some uh, discussion of questions as we usually do. So I have earlier sent to you the LI2429, as well as the, uh, what do you call it, the, the district uh, uh, court uh, rules or the amendment of the, of the court acts. No, sorry, this district court amendment rules there. So first we will start with the LI2429 and the importance of this uh, lies in the fact that we know that the core structure of Ghana is made up of uh, two main compartments, the superior courts of judicature, uh, then the lower courts, or what used to be called the inferior court of uh, judicature. So as far as the superior courts of judicature is concerned, we've discussed it extensively. We know the Supreme Court is the APS court, the final court. It has a special jurisdiction, original jurisdiction for interpretation of the constitution. It has the supervisory jurisdiction over the other courts and other adjudicating bodies in the country. Uh, it has a special uh, jurisdiction regarding whether a disclosure should be made in respect of a document, either it, it's uh, sensitive to national security and so on and so forth. And uh, so these are some of the uh, jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So we know the composition, we know like the qualification, who has to be a Supreme Court judge, a minimum standing of uh, 15 years uh, at the bar. And then uh, you must be a person of uh, uh, good character. You must not have any uh, moral uh, scandal and so on and so forth. So we know all this and we look at the court of appeal, we look at the high court, we look at the regional tribunal. And then we have like the, the lower courts, that is the circuit court uh, followed by the district court. Now, in the past, the jurisdiction of the lower court, especially uh, circuit courts and the district court were uh, very limited, especially with respect to the monetary jurisdiction. That is the quantum of money or money's worth of subject matter, which uh, could be entertained by the district court and the circuit court. So what uh, the court's regulation uh, sought to do is that uh, the attorney general exercising the powers that uh, it has been given by the court's act uh, 2000, I mean, the course of 1993 at 459, uh, bid the LI 2429, uh, by which it simply uh, sought to increase the monetary jurisdiction of uh, uh, these lower courts. So uh, these are some of the, and of course, if you look at the uh, session one of, uh, of the LI, uh, headed purpose of these rules is to expand the jurisdiction of the district courts and the circuit courts in respect of claims with the stated the monetary. <laughs> Somebody is talking about Joan Menu and Vassin Skanda. Uh, okay, let's move on. All right. Uh, please. Uh, don't let us turn our, this is purely a uh, legal revision, right? It's not a political science class, neither is it for just discussing general current affairs, no. Uh, if current affairs at all, uh, we should always look at it from the, the legal uh, angle. Yeah, so if you're interested in the the health minister's uh, issue and then the band, uh, the, the, the the scandal or the allegation of scandal around the, the vaccine acquisition. Yeah, I mean, that one you are gravitating towards the realm of procurement law. And procurement law, in my view, is not part of the, the courses that you are supposed to be examining. So 
uh, we need not waste our time on the procurement law. Yeah, but if you have the luxury of time, then we can go into some of these matters. So let's uh, stay focused for the time being. So I was emphasizing the, the fact that uh, the Attorney General used the power that had been given under the Coast Act at 459 and made uh, uh, this airline by which uh, the Attorney General sought to expand the jurisdiction of the district courts in the circuit court as far as the monetary value is concerned. And if you look at the, uh, the old, uh, uh, you notice that the amount of money in terms of I know, the cases, the, the monetary value of cases that the district court could you know that was very limited. So for uh, district court, for example, now, now in personal actions uh, arising under contract or tort, or for recovery of a liquidated sum of money, if the amount does not exceed uh, 2 million uh, Ghana uh, cities, <clears throat> the court has a uh, jurisdiction. You can uh, take it to the circuit court. It has a jurisdiction. So that is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, huge. And of course, when it comes to application for uh, early or application for probate, again, where the value of the estate does not exceed 2 million. Uh, it has uh, the recession. Previously, you have had to go to the, the, the high court before you could do that. But now the circuit court uh, can entertain claims, the value of which uh, does not exceed 2 million Ghana cities. Now with respect to the district court, the district court uh, monetary jurisdiction has also been expanded. So cases, be it a, a contractual case, a tort or debt recovery or anything. So far as the value does not exceed 500,000 Ghana cities, you can take it to the district court. Uh, I think this is a, a very, uh, and of course, when you also come to land litigation, right? Land litigation or property litigation, so far as the value of the uh, of the property, the house or the land, does not exceed five hundred thousand Ghana cedis. You can go it. You can take it to the district court. And uh, similar vein, when it comes to uh, probate, right? When it comes to probate or letters of administration and probate, if the value of the estate of the disease does not exceed five hundred thousand Ghana cedis, we can also take it to the the district court uh, as it were. So I think that uh, these are some of the things uh, that we should keep in mind as far as the monetary jurisdiction of the lower courts, circuit courts and the district courts are concerned. And of course, uh, in terms like of the rules, uh, which also govern uh, practice before the, the district court, the rules of court committee, uh, also made uh, some adjustment. And uh, as far as the district court is concerned, uh, now there has been what you call like the mainstreaming, right? Mainstreaming of uh, ADR, alternative dispute resolution mechanism. That is to say that if you have a case uh, pending before the district court, it is uh, made mandatory for the, the magistrate to, for example, uh, let the parties uh, undergo ADR. So for example, if you look at uh, rule one, uh, that where a case is called for hearing and all the parties attend, the court shall, except where the dispute is by law, not amenable to settlement, first inquire from the parties the parties are willing to attempt settlement of the case by alternative uh, dispute resolution or other means. So what that means is that now a judge or magistrate sitting in the district court has an obligation to explore the possibility of getting the case before it uh, settled by any of the means of uh, alternative uh, dispute uh, resolution. And usually you start from like an mediation and all that. I think that is uh, uh, what is important 
uh, for us to know. And if the parties agree that uh, they would like that to be done, then uh, maximum one month, uh, they are supposed to finish uh, hearing uh, the matter. But of course, where the parties uh, fail to reach an agreement, then uh, the court will go through like the traditional method and take evidence and all that. So these are the things that uh, I wanted to bring to your attention as far as the court structure is concerned. So before I move on to another thing tonight, I would like to take uh, two or three questions or comments or additions as far as the, the court structure is concerned. Uh, if, uh, as I told you, I'm not going to call those who use only their phone names, right? Maybe iPhone, whatever. If you raise up your hand, if you don't have a name, you will not be called only those who have some name. Yeah, so barrister, that is fine, okay? Yeah, good evening, Doc. Yeah. Uh, I, I I noticed from the you sent to us or the amendment, I read them in the afternoon and I noticed that unlike when it is a novel a legislation or a new act, usually when they are doing the amendment, they don't give a memorandum or I don't know whether I don't see it. So for the ones you've just uh, spoken on about the amendment of the jurisdiction of the circuit and this record. I, I don't know what informed, if we may ask, or if we'll be implicit to ask, what informed the decision of the AG to expand the jurisdiction? Can, can we reason around there, maybe just try to find out why, why was it necessary to, I mean, increase the monetary jurisdiction of these two in particular? Thank you. Right, all right, thank you very much. I think the, your question is informed by your understanding of Article 106 of the 1992 Constitution, uh, which is to the effect that uh, if you are to introduce a bill in Parliament and all that, you have to you have to be accompanied by an explanatory memorandum explaining uh, the intended uh, changes, what is wrong with the existing law, and so on and so forth. So that is what is informing Barrister's question. However. Uh, I must say that the two uh, you know, pieces of law we've looked at are different. Uh, Article 106 is applicable only to a bill, which is on its way to become an act of parliament. That is a, a primary legislation. But what we have looked at, we are, what we call the delegated legislation or subsidiary legislation. So the LI, uh, which empowers the attorney general to revise the monetary jurisdiction of the lower courts, circuit court and district court. That is uh, an example of delegated legislation. So it's, it, 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 since it's a delegated legislation, it does not have to comply with the 106 of the, of the 1992 constitution. And, and, and in practice uh, and conventionally, uh, where airlines are being made, and all, or, or even other forms of legislative legislations are being made, you don't get a memorandum. All that you get is that there will be a provision at the beginning telling uh, the reader the source of authority, that is where the power is derived from for making that ally. And that was why if you look at the one that we, we the, the one with the respect to the, uh, what do you call the ally, uh, 24, uh, 29, for example. Let me just show it again. If you look at the LI 24, 29, you notice that uh, if you look at the very beginning, let me show you. And so LI 24, 24, regulations. If you look at the very beginning, look at this. In exercise of the power conferred on the Attorney General by subsection four of section 42 and section four of the section 47 of the Courts Act, 1993 at 459. These regulations are made this day, uh, this eighth day of October, 2020. So uh, this, so, and, and it's quite typical when we are dealing with delegated legislation, you will get what you call the preamble. And all that it seeks to do is to declare the source of authority for making that law. So where is the power derived from? So here, 
you are being told that the power to make it is derived from session 42 and 47 of the course Act 1993 at 459. Yeah, so that is how it is. And in a similar vein, if we look at the, uh, let's look at this one. Yeah, if we look at the, uh, this is called amendment rules, which is made by the, it's supposed to be made by like the, the rules of court committee because the rules of court committee, they are responsible for making the rules uh, governing uh, practice before uh, the court. So if you look at that one, for example, look at this, in exercise of the power conferred on the rules of court committee by clause uh, two of article 157. So if you go to article 157 of the 1992 constitution, you will see the uh, provision uh, on the rules of court committee. For example, uh, 157, we say that there shall be a rules of court committee and then the composition is there. Uh, which are consist of the chief that says, which shall be the chairman, six members of the judicial council, two lawyers, and, and so on. And then the, the 1572 will say that the rules of court committee shall by constitutional instrument make rules and regulation for regulating the practice and procedure of all courts in Ghana. So all courts, both superior courts of judicature and then the lower courts. And so this, uh, this record amendment rule 2019 is emanating from the rules of court committee. And as I told you, you have like a preamble and the preamble tells you the source of authority, just as we saw in the case of LI 2429. And for LI 2429, the source of authority is the Courts Act. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think that's what I can say, uh, Barrister. Uh, Tommy? Yeah, Tommy, you can meet yourself. Yeah, Tommy, Hello, Doc. Yes. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Please, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, when I logged in, okay, so when I logged in, I heard you uh, talking about the monetary value for both the district courts and then the circuit court. Yes. Uh, first, I would like to know, uh, is it the value, is it in Ghana's CD or you said the district court is, district court is 500,000 and then the circuit court is 2 million. Uh, do you wish to save 50,000 Ghana uh, for district courts and uh, the, your line is not clear. Your line is not clear, but what I hear, what I can, if I understood you uh, correctly, uh, is that you want to... Uh, your line is not clear, so you can you can use the chat so that we can read your question. Mm. So uh, please, re read the chat so that we can uh, read your, uh, your question. Your line is not clear. Two million dollars. For it, the two million, two million or uh, old currency is referring to. Yes, no, I mean uh, the the currency is uh, the new uh, the new currency. Ghana City, not the old Ghana City. All right. Is a new one, not the old one. So Ghana City. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. Let me just open. Um, so.
and we have a question we haven't uh, finished looking at. Let's look at it now. We look at the 2016 questions. Here. Okay, so uh, last time we were discussing uh, the questions uh, which uh, some of you sent on the platform as having come from the uh, Central uh, University when they did a mock or something like that. And then I had advised you that as far as I'm concerned, uh, the type of exams are going to do is such that uh, no question is unimportant, no question is too important. So you have to pay attention to uh, anything which you come across. Uh, since anything related to the six examinable uh, subject areas uh, have equal chances of coming. And so that was the, the, the purpose for which we be discussing that. So at the last time we ended that question 27. Uh, so I suppose that uh, we will continue with uh, session 28. We continue with session 28. <clears throat> a glow against the uh, support, a glow against the support is authority for the proposition that <clears throat> the sale of family land by the head of family. Acting alone is void double, but not void. True or false? Anybody? This is a, a old customary landlord. <clears throat> Before Act 1036. Yes, can anybody uh, try? And again, as I said, uh, this is also like the, <clears throat> the type of question that uh, <clears throat> you know or you don't know, although you may know the position that the head of family alone cannot uh, sell the family land, but you may not be aware as whether uh, that position of the law was laid down in uh, a blow against uh, SAPO. And this is a very old uh, decision of the uh, 1947 uh, during the, the West African uh, Court of Appeal. Yes, what is the position? True or false? Anybody? Okay, so I have uh, the case of uh, a blow against uh, uh, Sapo uh, in a blow and Sapo. Uh, which also apply Kuma in Kuma. Uh, Chief, that is uh, Arajan, uh, who presided over the case, uh, made the following uh, observation. And I <clears throat> will just uh, uh, portions of the uh, judgments. There are, I'm just quoting portion of the judgments. Uh, there are therefore two points. I'm just quoting uh, from the case. There are therefore two points for serious consideration in this case. The first is whether the so-called conveyance by four of the principal members of the family 
dead impacts according to native law and custom convey the land to the respondent's predecessor in title. In other words, was the learned trial judge correct when he stated as follows? Uh, I am satisfied from the evidence that as it would be was signed by a headman at the time when there was a split in the family. And I agree with the evidence of a Kumia who was called by the court. And I hold the heads who granted the land to support were entitled to do so according to native custom and under the circumstances which existed in the family. If the defendant's contention is correct, how can they explain the reason why all these years no one has challenged GA support's right to deal with the market as his own property, grand portions of the land, even to a Nigerian who is a total stranger? Then so the judge uh, continued. Uh, when the learned Raja refers to the circumstance which is in the family, we can only presume that he meant to refer to the fact that the head of the family, Pobi, and one other principal members were at variance with the other four members. It would therefore appear that the question for consideration is whether because the head of family is at variance with the majority of his members, this automatically gives the majority the right to dispose of family land. So this is the, the essential aspect of the judgment. So it would therefore appear that the question for consideration is whether because the head of family is at variance with the majority of its members, this automatically gives the majority of the right to dispose of family land. It should here be noted that Council for Respondent contends that there is some difference in native law and custom between the procedure necessary for the transfer of title in line to a stranger into a member of the family. He was, however, unable to produce any authority to support this statement, nor have you been able to find any, so that the question is confined to the simple decision as whether majority of the principal members of the family can dispose absolutely of family lands without concern of the head of the family, if they so desire. So if you are following, this is where you're going to get the answer. So the question, the simple, I mean, uh, the judge said that uh, uh, the question is confined to the simple decision as whether the majority of the principal members of the family can dispose absolutely of the family lands without the consent of the head of the family if they so desire. And the judge continues to provide the answer. In the first place, we can find no authority for the statement that the principal members of the family can give any title in the conveyance of family land without the head of family joining in the conveyance, even though we be in agreement. So the judge is trying to say that uh, there is no uh, authority to support the claim that uh, some family members uh, can just uh, alienate the family land without involvement or without the consent of the head of family. So that is the first uh, point is established. Then the judge will continue. So, so, so long as 1889, it was held in the case of Insihia against Siemens that family property cannot be sold except by the head of family with the concurrence of the elder members of the family. And although Sabbath's book on the principle on, on the principle of anti customary law, it is assumed that in every case, the land is alienated by the head of the family. The only question that is dealt with at length is the necessity for the principal members of the family to concur in alienation. In the judgment of the Privy Council in Kuma and Kuma, their lordship could approve a portion of the judgment of Rena, which reads, the next fact which is important to bear in mind in order to understand the native land law is that the notion of individual ownership is quite foreign to native ideas. Land belongs to the community, the village or the family, never to the individual. All the members of the community, all the members of the community or village or head of the family has charge of the land and in the loose mode of speech is sometimes called the owner. He is to some extent in the position of a trustee and as such holds the land for the use of the community or family. He had control of it and any member who wants a piece of it to cultivate or build a house upon goes to him for it. But the land so give, but the land so given still remains the property of the community or family. He cannot make any important disposition of the land 
without consulting the elders of the community or family. And their consent must in all cases be given before a grant can be made to a stranger. We, with greatest respect, entirely agree with the statement in the above petition that the head of family will be considered to be in an analogous position to a trustee, from which it follows that it is quite impossible for land to be legally transferred a legal title given without his consent. The alleged deed as if it be was therefore void up in issue and the respondents derived no right of absolute ownership by virtue thereof. The only remedy that the family have is to remove the head of family if they do not approve of him. And this had not been done in the present case. Okay, so I think there we have the answer. We don't need to continue again. So the position of the law is that, uh, the Aglo against Sapo decided that the, the sale of the family land by head of family alone is voidable, but not void. Uh, true or false? True or false? True or false? I'll give you enough. Uh, Uh, okay, to me and then uh, Ninebe, the regular contributors. Okay. Yes, to me and Ninebe. Yes. Yeah, to me first and then Ninebe. Uh, doctor, it's false. It's false. No, it's false. Okay. Uh, Ninebe. So I think it's true. Okay. And the, the interest is that all of you listen to the judgment that uh, I read to you, and yet we have a differing answers. Okay, so why true? And then uh, Tommy, why false? Okay, sir. Uh, what I what I read from the judgment is that uh, when it comes to family property where it is the head of the family that disposes of the assets. But the head of the family disposes of the property with the concurrence of the principal members of the family. Please, can you hear me? Yes, I'm listening. Okay, so the head of the family disposes of the property with the concurrence of the principal members of the family. Now, it says, if the head of the family alone disposes of the assets without the concurrence of the family, the principal members, it is void. However, if it happens that the head of the, of the family disposes of the property with some sizable number or some number of principal uh, uh, members of the family who are supposed to agree with him, but they are not enough, or they don't form majority, then it may be void double in that instance. But from the question we have, we are only told that the head of the family can act alone and dispose of the family property, which to me is never, it's never, uh, 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 had recourse to the principal members of the family. For that matter, the alienation itself is void. It's not voidable. It's not like it was rightly done with some small number of principal members of uh, the family. That is my reason. So that's your reason for saying that it's false. Is that all for, uh, were you the it's one who said true or false? For me? I said false. Of false, yeah. okay. All right. Okay, now let's listen to Nenebe. Nenebe, have you abandoned your position? Nenebe, can you? Uh, so no, I've not abandoned my position. Okay. I think it is true because um, the law says that a sale of a family land must be done by the head of the family. And it should be with the concurrence of the principal members of the family. If the family head alone 
makes a sale of a family land, it is not void. void. It is voidable. Void. At the instance of the principal members, if the principal members are quiet over the issue, the land, the sale of the land is as valid as anything until the principal members take steps to set it aside or to raise the issue of its voidability to void it. Then in that, so on this principle, but but then you are not speaking from Ablo and Sapo. You are not speaking from Ablo and Sapo. You are speaking from another authority, isn't it? You, no, I'm not speaking from Ablo and Sapo. The, I'm, I'm yeah, speaking okay. with. But the, but the question uh, is context specific. It's talking about Ablo and Sapo. Because I've I've just read the original decision from the the West Africa Court of Appeal. Uh, in which they applied the privy court decision in the Kuma in Kuma. Yes, I think I've seen other uh, new hands up. So let me call them. Uh, uh, please, the one the, the one with no name, you know I will not call you. So just put a name there, otherwise I cannot call. Uh, uh, so let me, Jamila, yeah. Jamila. Okay, Doc. Please, I think that the, that the, the if position- you put, if you uh, put any name there, it's fine, right? I don't really, uh, I'm not interested in your identity, but I want to be able to call a name, not just like a, a gadget or just, a, yeah. So Jamila Munkala, yes. Yes, please. Uh, doctor, I think that the position that Nene B just um, espoused there was the one that was um, espoused in the Kuma and Kuma. But from what you read, I think that um, they, uh, they made reference to the Kuma and Kuma, but that was not the decision in the Aglo and the Sapo. I think the Aglo and the Sapo, if you look at the um, like the facts of what you read on the basis of what you read for the, because um, I think that it spoke the reverse of what the position is. And so, that is why I disagree with um, the first speaker and then the second speaker, because the second speaker um, didn't base his argument on the Agulu and Sapo, even though what he stated is the position of the law, but he didn't base his answer on the this so, so what is, so what in is the Agulu and Sapo. Thank what you. What is your position, uh, Jamila? There again, my position is false. OK. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me take Barista. Can Barista stand us up? Yes, Barista. Yeah, Doc, thank you. Um, I think I had you read the judgment, and what I had was uh, I agree that the answer should be true. Because when you were reading, you made mention that uh, the court was saying, like, in any case, it is the family who, who does the actual alienation or sale with the transfer of the land and only get the consent and concurrence of the principal members. And another portion which I clearly heard was that uh, if the members do not agree with the sale and whatever, or they are dissatisfied by the alienation, they can only maybe commence some kind of action to remove the head of family, but the sale was done and it will pass a good title. So based on these ones, if I really heard you right, I think the answer should be true. On the, on the ground of this case or on the basis of this case, the answer is true. It is voidable. If, if it will pass a good title, how will it be voidable? Yeah, I think it will be it will be a good title until they take steps to to set it aside, or perhaps maybe. No, but but if you if you listen to the judgment, well, the judgment does not support that, so the answer should be false. <laughs> the, no, uh, yeah, it's void double, but not void. I, I mean, that the answer should be false. If you analyze the sapo and the. Aglo and Zappo, I can put the judgment on your platform and then you can read it later on. But if you, if you read the judgment well, the answer should be false. Okay, so let's move on to uh, question. 
the later one, I just send you the judgment if you want to read it. Kofi rent his house out to Akosuya, who is a prostitute. Kofi at the time of renting the house, he don't know Akosuya was a prostitute. However, he later realized Akosuya was unusually entertaining many men and young women in the house. Akosuya is eight months behind on her rent and Kofi is threatening to bring a nation to recover the rent arrears because Akosuya is refusing to pay. A. So we have this scenario. And of course, this uh, scenario should right away tell you that uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, the era of law, which is a contract, particularly illegality and public policy. And the, as to whether such a contract is enforceable or not. So let's look at the scenarios. A, Kofi can recover the arrears because the contract is for necessary. If you are talking about uh, illegality in public, uh, public policy, uh, necessaries and so on uh, do not come in. Uh, uh, B, Kofi cannot recover the arrears because the contract is unenforceable, okay? So I think the, the way they frame the answers is going to make the, the correct answer very easy for us. Because let's say that A, we're able to cross out A by elimination method that uh, A relates to capacity, and the question is not dealing with capacity, right? So A is no, no, no. A is out. Then we come to uh, we come to a B. A B, you see, unenforceable, and you know that illegality and public policy is actually to render a contract unenforceable. So uh, B is a, a, a very good candidate for the correct answer. But let's test that against the remaining answer C. Kofi can recover the arrears because the contract is voidable. There's nothing like uh, voidable and uh, void when it comes to uh, illegality and public uh, policy as it were. Uh, the contract being voidable, being uh, valid or being uh, voidable and all that relates to issue of consent, genuineness of consent as whether the consent was given genuinely or obtained genuinely, or it was vitiated by any of the known vitiating factors. So uh, that will not come in. And if voidable relates to issues of uh, genuineness of consent, then void to, and for that, or, or capacity. So uh, C and D are out. And for that matter, B is the correct word, uh, answer. Who is not uh, clear why B is the correct answer? You can let us know your position and then we will look at it. Okay, dual citizen cannot hold any of the positions below. Uh, remember, I've asked you to be reading uh, the constitution. I should read 10 uh, articles a day. And under the time is closed. If you've not been reading, you're, uh, you're not going to start. Then my advice is that uh, since you have about four days to write the exams, you can do uh, uh, 35 uh, articles in a day. If you do 35 articles in a day, I think that uh, you should finish it uh, four or five days before you do the, the exam. That is if you've not been reading at all. But if you are those who have been uh, reading since I advise you, then you have nothing to really uh, worry about as it were. Good, so uh, dual citizen, being a dual citizen, uh, there are certain positions that uh, you cannot uh, hold. So what are those uh, positions? A, chief director of a ministry. B, Secretary of the Cabinet, C, Inspector General of Police, D, uh, High Court Judge. Okay, so um, yeah, our mind will have to go to the provision on the dual citizen, but like, which is obviously Article 8, but Article 8, although we will just yeah. remind ourselves of uh, what it says, but that will not provide the answer. We still need to go to some other uh, provision. So article eight, uh, that 
a citizen of Ghana shall cease for you to be a citizen of Ghana. But of course, this provision has been uh, uh, amended, uh, as you are aware. Although I don't have like the amendment uh, with me. Uh, so has anybody got the, the amendment to uh, which regularize the issue of the uh, dual citizen or make, making it possible. Okay, let's go on. Because if you look at the original article eight, a citizen of Ghana shall cease for way to be a citizen of Ghana if on a tenure of 21 years by voluntary act other than marriage, acquires or retains citizenship of a country other than Ghana. Okay, then you become a dual citizen. But what are the, the, the legal disability visited upon a person who has a dual citizenship? If you look at, as I said, if you look at the Article 8, you not get the, uh, the solution. So let's go to the chapter on the executive and then you go to the high court uh, judge. But again, uh, this is uh, another... Is anybody familiar with the, the, the amendment relating to citizenship? Has anybody got the law? Has anybody got the law with him or her? Yes, okay. Ernest, we can, yeah, we can meet yourself. Ernest, you can mute yourself. Ernest, you can mute yourself. I believe you. Ernest, did you raise up your hand in the. I believe you, unless you raise up your hand in the, uh, accidentally. Yes, Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Ines, go ahead. Mr. Ekwau, yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Uh... Um, the amendment to it, um, uh, section uh, article H1. Um, I'm reading the entire right. No. Yes, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Enes, are you there? Okay, uh, I think we've lost Enes, so Ni has come. Jacob too is here. Yeah, good evening, Bob. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. The, the amendment is Act Five Two Seven. Okay. Which is last the chief. Okay. Uh, he mentioned Ambassador of or High Commissioner, Secretary. Ambassador High Commissioner. Hello, Ni. Oh, is it my internet? Hello, okay. Ni. Oh. Yes. Uh, oh. So you get it now. Yeah, yeah, sorry. My internet went off. Yeah, uh, I miss I miss what you're saying. Yes, what I'm saying is that yes. the amendment is at at five two seven. Right. That's article eight of the constitution is repealed, and the following following 
that's the bracket, dual citizenship. Eight, one, a citizen of Ghana may hold the citizenship of any other country in addition to this citizenship of Ghana. Right. Two, without prejudice to Article 94, two, A of the Constitution, no citizen of Ghana shall qualify to be appointed as a holder of any office swear in this clause if he holds the citizenship of any other country in addition to his citizenship of Ghana. Right. A, ambassador or high commissioner. Okay. B, secretary to the cabinet. Right. C, chief of defense staff or any service chief. B, inspector general of police. E, commissioner, custom exile and preventive service. F, director of immigration service. And G, any office specified by an act of parliament. Three, where the law of a country requires a person who marries a citizen of that country to renounce the citizenship of his own country by virtue of that marriage, a citizen of Ghana who is deprived of his citizenship of Ghana by virtue of that marriage shall, on the dissolution of the, that marriage, become a citizen of Ghana. Okay. Amendment ends. Right. Okay, so thank you. So thank you, Annie. So in the light of the uh, provision that Annie uh, uh, read for us, uh, which of the stated positions uh, can be held by a person who would do a citizenship? And of course, as I said, this is a type of question that uh, is context specific. Context specific in the sense that you either know what is in the law or you don't know it. There's very little guessing that we can do. Uh, okay, Francis. Yes, I good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, I, I think in addition to what Ni has just read, I think uh, the amendment took place in uh, uh, 19. Uh, uh, 96. Yes. But, but then again, in, in, in 2000, we have uh, the Citizenship Act, that is Act 591, uh, that has been promulgated by Parliament. Okay. And that particular act, Section 16, uh, Section 161, has, has added to the list of, of the uh, offices that have been prohibited by the Amendment Act, which you just read. So what Niha just read is not exhaustive. The, the yeah, list so, has so, increased. Yeah, so add to the list, if you have the list before you. Uh, yes, I don't have the uh, the act that is at 591 with me, but then the list there is akin to uh, the provision in the constitution that is article 286. Right. When you check article 286 clause five, all those offices in the, in the article 286 clause five have been captured that is by at 591 in addition to um, um, at 527, which um, um, Ni has just read. So probably if we have our constitution- oh, then Yeah, so if we, uh, okay, so I have, I've opened to uh, uh, 2865. So it says like the public office to which provision of this article apply, those of the president of the public, vice president, speaker, deputy speaker, minister of state or deputy uh, minister, Chief that says, Justice of the Superior Court, uh, Ambassador or High Court or High Commissioner, Secretary to Cabinet, Head of Ministry or Government Department or Equivalent Office in the Civil Service, uh, Chairman, Managing Director, General Manager, and Departmental Head of Public Operation or Company in which the state has a controlling interest. And J, such officers in the public service and any other public institution as parliament may prescribe. Okay, so uh, that is the full list. So let's uh, apply that to uh, what we have. Now, if you look at it then, uh, I think is the IGP mentioned, the Inspector General of Police. I think I have not so far, I've not come across him in the in the list. Uh, I don't know what the, what the need, uh, need, whether it is there, but, uh, on, 
I, I, I still find it a, a bit strange that, okay, look, that is someone with the, yes, Ni, your hand is up again about accident. Yes, uh, uh, IGP is in it. Is in it. Wow, then in that case, yes, yes, IGP is in it. But, but, then in that case, there's no, answer, put there's no answer to the question. Yeah. If IGP is in it, then the question is not correct. Because if you look at the, all the things I have read, all, all of them are captured. The chief director is the, if you look at article 2865 uh, H, head of ministry. Because if you are a chief director, you are the head of ministry in the civil service capacity, isn't it? Is the chief director not head of the ministry? Me? Okay, it's gone. Yeah, so chief director is head of ministry. So in that case, uh, that cannot be done. The secretary of the cabinet is mentioned. Uh, we've seen that. And then the uh, high court judge is mentioned. So if IGP is also in the list, then we don't have an answer to the question, meaning that all those positions cannot be held by a dual citizen. Unless I am back. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, okay. Ni was, was it, who was talking? Was it Francis? Sir, it was Ni, Ni was trying to draw your attention, sir. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Ni? Yeah, what, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, the, uh, Act 591, that Citizenship Act, mm -hmm. uh, Section 16, includes the Inspector General of Police. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the list is longer here. But there was an M, any other public office that the minister may, by legislation instrument, prescribe, which was made unconstitutional by Assyrian and Attorney General. That's what I was trying mm -hmm. to draw attention to. OK. 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 Uh... And then. Uh, the, the existing five says a citizen who has lost his citizenship as a result of the law of the law in Ghana, which prohibit the holding of dual citizenship by a Ghanaian, may on an application to the minister be issued a certificate of citizenship which shall be effective from the date of issue, which has also been made unconstitutional by Asari and Attorney General. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Hubert. Yeah, Hubert. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, I think uh, so far, um, I don't know, probably Nick would help us with this since he has the latest list. But I haven't heard um, High Court uh, Judge. Who is speaking? Is it Francis? Yes, please. It's Francis. I haven't heard High Court Judge so far in all the three lists that we have, both from the Constitution and then from uh, the. No, no, no. High Court is the uh, Superior Court, please. Is, is mentioned. Okay. Uh, it's mentioned Superior okay. Court of Judicature, and we've said that Superior Court of Judicature starts from High Court, Court of Appeal to Supreme Court. So if you look, if if assuming uh, uh, the argument that we had uh, that the list is uh, analogous or coterminous with what we have in Article 286, uh, Clause 5, then if you look at the 286, Clause 5, uh, Paragraph C, it says that Chief Justice Justice of the Superior Court of Judicature and Justice of the Superior Court of Judicature includes the High Court judge. Uh, uh, sir, sir, I, I, I wish Nick could help us with um, the latest amendment, which is uh, at, at um, 591, whether he will spot that one in there. Because that has been the 2000 uh, amendment. The, that's the latest list. Hello. Yes. Hello, Doc. Uh, yes, uh, who is talking? Just make sure that I know who is it, Francis? I no, okay, go ahead, whoever, whoever, go ahead, go ahead, please. Uh, I think the person is gone, okay, who better? Hello, 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 yeah, Article 286 that we are mentioning is in respect of declaration of assets. Yes. It does not have to do with this. Um, 
the provisions that govern the citizenship, um, the amendment to the constitution as well as um, the Citizenship Act. And all those uh, offices mentioned under the constitution are subsumed under the Citizenship Act section. So That's if true. we want to know the if we want to know the exhaustive offices, the list of offices that um, a dual citizen is proscribed from holding, then we section 16 of the Citizenship Act. And it, it mentions the um, Chief Justice and Justices of the Supreme Court, not Superior Courts. So okay. Chief Justice and Justice of the Supreme Court. We have the Ambassador of, or High Commissioner we have the secretary to cabinet, chief of defense staff, or any service chief, the, IG, the commissioner, custom, excise, and preventives, director of immigration, the commissioner, value added tax service, director of prison service, chief fire officer, chief director of the, the rank of a colonel in the army or its equivalent in any other security service and any other public office by legislative instrument prescribed and which uh, we've been told Attorney General has made or uh, has declared unconstitutional. We look at the list. The High Court, the justice of the High Court is not inclusive. Okay, then. So, okay, then uh, so far as uh, uh, Section 16 is explicit, that is the Chief Justice and Justice of the Supreme Court. And what it means is that uh, under the edges, uh, the position can be held by a dual citizen. Okay, thank you, uh, Hubert. Uh, I've seen other hands up. Uh, somebody called the BU. Yeah. Uh, is it by accident? Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yes, good evening, Doug. Yeah, I just wanted to say what exactly the uh, the last uh, 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 speaker said. That what was in Article Two Eight Six was a bit different from what we have Act Five Nine One says. It is talking about a justice of the the CJ or a justice of the Supreme Court and not Superior Court. Right. So when you look at the answers, the High Court judge is the odd one out. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let's move on. 31, under which of the following categories can a person be deprived of his Ghanaian citizenship? A citizen by naturalization, citizen by registration, citizen by adoption, and citizen by marriage. Yeah, so we go to the Constitution and then the Citizenship Act again. And the We still have some hands up for they are just uh, the old one. Uh, w uh, Ellen is your hand up? Okay, she's gone. Um, yeah, Hubert, your hand is up. Hubert. Uh, that was the previous hand. I'll get back to you in due course. All right. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's look at the, the relevant uh, provision of the, uh, the Citizenship Act and then the Articles 8, uh, 7 of the Constitution as well. I put the legislation on the, the platform so those of you who are there, in case you don't have the don't have the, you don't have it, you can, you can, you can get it. But let's say a few words about uh, uh, each of this, uh, certainly by naturalization. Uh, let's even comment on them, uh, how it is uh, actualized or how it comes, how it's possible. So if we look at the uh, citizenship law, of course, we have the, how do you call it, the use solely and then the use sangonis. Uh, like 
theoretically, a lot of countries, uh, one of these two will determine uh, your citizenship. Either you are born uh, on the soil, that in the, the territory, or uh, you descend from uh, someone belonging to a particular territory. So in which case, you have uh, the blood, what you call the, 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 the sangonis, and then, and then if by just you are born in the particular territory, that is the solar. So these are what we have uh, worked into our citizenship act and also into the constitution. And we have uh, citizenship by naturalization. But this is by naturalization is uh, where a person was not born uh, in a particular territory, was not born in Ghana, but did not descend uh, from anybody uh, who is a Ghanaian. But the person uh, comes and lives in Ghana and becomes so used to our way of life that the person is uh, assimilated. And by reason of the assimilation, uh, he or she would like to perfect his relationship with our country by becoming uh, one of us. So let's look at the procedure which the Citizenship Act uh, provides for acquiring uh, citizenship by naturalization. Uh, session. Okay, uh, that's a session. 13. Uh, yeah, session 13. And so if we look at the session 13, the minister may, with the approval of President grant certificate of naturalization to a person of age and capacity who satisfied the minister that he is qualified under Section 14 of this Act for naturalization. A person uh, to whom certificate of naturalization is granted shall take the oath of allegiance and become a citizen by naturalization on the date on the oath of allegiance is taken. So uh, that is how we get uh, uh, a certain financialization. But then who is eligible? Who qualifies to apply for naturalization? Uh, so look at the section 14, uh, that to be eligible for naturalization, uh, the following should apply. A, uh, the person must have resided in Ghana throughout the period of 12 months, immediately preceding the date of the application. So at least uh, you should have been in Ghana 12 months before you put in the application. Uh, B, uh, during seven years, immediately preceding the period of 12 months, he has resided in Ghana uh, for a period amounting in aggregate to not less than uh, five years. So if we take the, uh, the if we take the last, uh, my screen is not stable. If we take the, the last seven years before you put in the application, if you do the aggregation, if you do the adding up, the various times that you've stayed in Ghana, uh, if for nothing at all, you should be able to get uh, five years out of the seven uh, years in which we can say that uh, you have stayed in Ghana. Not necessarily like uh, uh, continuous, but like when it's aggregated, at least it should uh, sum up to five years. And that is not enough. Uh, see, the applicant or the person has a good character, as attested in writing by two Ghanaians, uh, being not less than uh, senior public officers. So you should get at least uh, two senior public uh, two senior public officers or equivalent uh, uh, standing in Ghanaian society, who attest that you're a person of uh, a good character. And D, you'd not be sentenced to any period of imprisonment. In Ghana or anywhere recognized by law in Ghana. For, I mean, for an offense recognized by law in Ghana, uh, he is able to speak and understand an indigenous uh, Ghanaian language. So you have to learn one of the local languages. And, and for good reason, that's why I said that it's by its own assimilation, because assimilation means that you are not a Ghanaian, but you have become like a Ghanaian, the way that we do things, including the way that we speak, we speak and all that. And that is why 
you, how can you say you're Ghanaian if we take the over 100 Ghanaian languages, you can't speak any of them, then uh, you are suspect because the English language is not our indigenous language. So if you can speak only that and you cannot speak any of the over 100, lang 100 Ghanaian languages, then that is a, a question mark. Then uh, F, he is a person who has made or who is capable of being a, of making a substantial contribution to the progress, advancement in any area of national security. So if you want to become one of us, you want to be bringing something which will enhance uh, quality of life. Uh, J is a person who has been assimilated into Ghanaian way of life, or who can easily be assimilated. Yeah, so you to be able to, in terms of the local food, at least, to be able to eat some, or some of the way that we dress, to be able to pick some of the things and all that. But you should show the desire that you're open to that and you don't show disrespect to our things. H, intends to reside permanently in Ghana in the event of certificate being granted him. And J, no, sorry, I, uh, yeah, J, he possess a, a valid, residence permits. Yeah, so you must have a, a valid uh, resident uh, permit before you put in your application. And if you were Ghana illegally, then that will disqualify you. Yeah, so that is how we get citizenship by naturalization. And we also have the citizenship by uh, registration. Session 10 uh, speaks to that. I know you have uh, read it by now. But just in case you are you know, tested on the distinction between citizenship by naturalization and registration, it's a bit close, but they are not the same. And that is why we have to look at uh, session 10. Now we've discussed how you get citizenship by naturalization, but let's look at the registration then we'll be able to draw the distinction. So section 10 of the Citizenship Act says that a citizen of age and capacity in the approved country may open application uh, and with the approval of the president be registered as a citizen of Ghana if he satisfy the minister that A, he is of good character, B, is ordinary resident in Ghana, C, he has been so resident throughout the period of five years or such a, or such a shorter period as a minister may in the special circumstances of any particular case accept immediately before the application. And D, he can speak and understand an indigenous uh, Ghanaian uh, language. So a person who is not a citizen and is who's married to a citizen may upon application in a prescribed manner be registered as a citizen. So you notice that uh, harassed naturalization does not require a marriage. Uh, Marriage can make you a good candidate for citizenship uh, by registration. So just marry a Ghanaian and then that entitles you to apply for citizenship by uh, registration as it were. Well, subsection three, a person an applied to African who was married to a person who was a citizen at the time of death of that person. Yeah, so if you were married to uh, someone at the time that, uh, like, the, I mean, the person you marry was a Ghanaian, but the person is dead, you are still qualified to apply for citizenship by registration. So that is what uh, section uh, 10, subsection uh, 3 is telling us. In subsection 4, where the marriage of a person registered as citizen under subsection 2 is dissolved, the person shall continue to be a citizen unless the citizenship is announced. So if you acquired citizenship by registration, uh, by virtue of being married to a citizen of Ghana, should there be dissolution of that marriage, it's not automatically going to result in uh, dissolution or revocation of your citizenship, no. You only uh, lose your citizen where you renounce it uh, as uh, it were. Uh, Subsection five, a child of a marriage of a person registered as a citizen shall continue to be a citizen unless the child renounces the citizenship. 
I mean, of course, it's logical. So if uh, you acquire citizenship by uh, registration or anything uh, of the sort and you get a child, then automatically that person wants to have the citizen, unless later on uh, he or she decide to uh, relinquish or renounce that uh, citizenship. Yeah, so you've seen that. So now we know the distinction between uh, citizenship by registration and citizenship by nationalization. Uh, yes, uh, who got your hand is up? Uh, some people have got their hands up. Uh, okay, so who better than me? I wanted to ask. We are not answering the question yet. I'm just speaking around the, the issue. Yeah, asking a question. Yes. Child under uh, section 10. Is it the legal definition of a child or the biological definition of a child? Well, section. Section 10, um, subsection 5. A child of a marriage. Of a marriage. A child of the marriage of a person registered as a and uh, subsection two uh, continue to be a citizen unless the child renounces the citizenship. Yeah, so your question is whether the child refers to what? Uh, the legal definition of a child, maybe someone who is less than 18 years and oh, no, said that when he yeah, okay, uh, all right, thank you, Hubert. But like, if you look at the provision, it, it's talking about citizenship of the, uh, I'm a, a child of the of the marriage of uh, a person who has acquired his citizenship in that regard. So certainly, uh, it will be a young person. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. practically, I mean, technically, uh, it doesn't really have to be like the, whether you are 18 years or what, but if you look at it, to all intents and purposes, if you look at the provision, a child of the marriage of a person registered as a citizen, right? And uh, as we uh, discussed, shall continue to be a citizen. Yeah, so the marriage, which marriage are you talking about? Of course, we are talking about, let's say that, uh, okay, somebody was a, a, a non ghanaian uh, married to a Ghanaian, they had a child. The child is now about uh, 25 years. And now the let's say the father who is not a Ghanaian wants to apply for citizenship uh, registration. What would be the status, the, the citizenship status of the child? Is that your question? Yes, please. No, but that should not be a problem because the mother was already uh, a Ghanaian. So the child can acquire citizenship or is already a, a citizen by the mother. And if he was even born in Ghana. If he was born in Ghana, then the, the, the child is a, I mean, the mother is a Ghanaian. So that will not be a problem. So the child does not need the mother to register to become like the, the citizen before the child can be a citizen. Because you don't need to have the two parents being citizens before you be a citizen of Ghana, isn't it? Yeah, you don't need to have the... the... Yeah, so I, I think that uh, that uh, should not be so much of a, a problem. Uh, I think this hand has been up for some time. Me? That, no, uh, before I come to my substantive uh, uh, statement, yeah. a child is a child. <laughs> a child by, or by law is somebody under 18 years. So that's how I understand it. I want us to go to uh, the citizenship by registration, uh, session 10, 4 and 5 is discriminatory. Session it, 10, 4 into black and 5. There's woman there. Where the marriage of a person into bracket woman ah. registered as a citizen under subsection 2 uh, no, is dissolved. Uh, the, the, the version I have, if you are reading session 10, subsection, is it 4 and 5, isn't it? Yes, four and five. That's yeah. I'm having the citizenship, citizenship act. Yeah, me, yeah, I, me, that one. me to have that. Do you have both the hard copy or soft copy? No, the hard copy, both from Ghana Publishing. Just 
five days ago. Oh, hard copy. Last Friday, yeah. Oh, okay. Then, uh, then I think that uh, uh, there's a, a problem somewhere. Maybe unless because the the the, the soft copy that I have, which I put on the WhatsApp platform that we have, uh, it reads as follows: uh, four, where the marriage of a person registered as a okay. citizen under subsection two is dissolved, the person shall continue to be a citizen unless the citizenship is renounced. And if you look at the five. A child of a marriage of a person registered as a citizen under subsection two shall continue to be a citizen unless the child renounces the citizen. So that is a version uh, I have uh, the PDF and from the data set. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen like unless I look at that because that is a version that I have. Uh, yes. yes. So that's that's what I wanted to draw your attention because along the line you see that. If, if somebody is fraudulently registered as a citizen, if the person is a woman, be a citizen. If the person is a, a, a man, they, they don't allow. As we, as we are learning, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. All right, my pleasure. Okay, so uh, I think the citizenship by marriage uh, is obvious. You don't need to believe that uh, if you get married to a Ghanaian, you're entitled to, yes. Uh, Hubert, your hand is up. Hubert, is your hand up? Sorry, I saw the previous one, sorry. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, so let's come back to the question itself. Uh, under which of the following category can a person be deprived of his citizenship? So let's go to session 18, deprivation of citizenship, session 18. The High Court may, on application by the Attorney General for purposes, for the purpose, deprive a person who is a citizen of Ghana otherwise than by birth or adoption yeah. of that citizenship on the ground, A, that the activities of that person are inimical uh, to the security of state or prejudicial to the public morality or interest, or B, that the citizenship was acquired by fraud, misrepresentation, or any other improper or irregular uh, practice. Yeah, so if uh, your citizenship, uh, apart from uh, by birth or by adoption, uh, it can be uh, revoked. And that is uh, what uh, we just read from question 18. And for that matter, if you look at the question, uh, which of the following person can have their citizenship deprived? Uh, A, citizenship by naturalization. B, citizenship by registration. C, citizenship by adoption. And D, citizenship by marriage. Yes. Yeah, so what is, the, what is your choice? We have read session uh, 18 uh, for you. Um, Doc, I, I wish you could help us with the reading again because I, I seem to be having a different understanding from um, 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 or a different deduction, dedu deduction from what you read. Right, so session 18, I'm reading again. Session 18 of the Citizenship Act. The High Court may on application by the Attorney General for the purpose, deprive a person who is a citizen of Ghana otherwise than by birth or adoption. Yeah, so the provision is taking out uh, citizenship by birth or adoption. So citizenship by birth yeah, exactly. cannot be deprived. Exactly so. So there's a, the way they made the question, I think that under which of the following can a person be prior with Ghanaian citizenship? I think it should be, cannot be. Exactly. Uh, so the so question is problematic person, because yeah, what has been said. Yeah, I think it should have been cannot. Because if you say, can a person be deprived with Ghanaian citizenship? If you look at the section 18, section 18 has made exception in respect of citizenship by birth and citizenship by adoption. So thankfully, we don't have citizenship by birth in uh, four options. We have citizenship by adoption. 
And Section 18 is saying that if you are citizenship with by adoption, then uh, the attorney general cannot go to court for you to be stripped of that uh, citizenship. So I think that uh, there's a, a, a typo somewhere. Maybe uh, the examiner intended cannot, and uh, the not did not come. So if it's cannot, then the answer will be uh, C. Uh, yes, Davidson's hand is up. Uh, Davidson. Davidson, your hand is up. Yes, you can talk. Davidson, yes. Yeah, Davidson, go ahead. Oh. Uh, I didn't release you, please. Uh, Davidson. Yes, yes, Prof. Uh, doc. So, Doc, can you hear me? Yes. Um, you know that with, with all the options given, when you naturalize, you're Ghanaian. When you register, you're Ghanaian. When you're adopted, you're Ghanaian. But when you marry, you're not necessarily a Ghanaian. Okay. So if you, with that line of reasoning, no, because no, you know- no, please. You, I don't know. I didn't get you again. Can you repeat yourself? I'm like, I'm like, when you naturalize, you are Ghanaian. Yes. When you naturalize, it's automatic, you are Ghanaian. Why when you? you register, when you naturalize, you are Ghanaian, okay. it's automatic. When you register, you it's automatic. You are like citizenship by naturalization, by registration, by adoption, but there's nothing like citizenship by marriage. You have to register, the, like the marriage is the process through which you actually register, then you become. Oh, I, I, to be I, to do. I understand, Davis, I understand the logic of your argument. Uh -huh. So, when, when when you, you, okay. Never, yeah. Nevertheless, if you look at the session 18, okay, uh, which we okay. read, if assuming session 18 uh, was not explicit, if session 18 had not, for example, uh, indicated that citizenship by birth or adoption, then we could uh, go by uh, your logic in one way or the other. Because I was thinking that, for example, let's say you get married to someone in the UK, you are Ghanaian, and you get some married to someone in the UK, you be married to him there, you are not a Ghanaian. When you come back to Ghana, we don't recognize you as a Ghanaian. So with that understanding, then that's what I was thinking. So that... Oh, right. Uh, I get your point. Yeah, so... Uh, the okay, I, I get I get your point. So, what it means is that you are saying that uh, if someone acquired a citizen by marriage, that person can be deprived. Uh, see, the logic of that argument will fall uh, flat when you have regard to section eighteen, because I think that section eighteen is the controlling uh, question as far as this question is concerned. Because of section eighteen. Uh, we, we have to stick to the conclusion that we've reached that the, the question omitted not. If the not is there, then the answer is C. But as it is now, uh, you can only be setting up a new question if you decided to uh, settle for, let's say, uh, D. Uh, yes, somebody's hand is up. Unless you have something, okay, let's take a uh, Ajo. Ajo. Good evening, Prof. Good evening. Yeah, so with what Francis was saying, I, I believe he's referring to the renunciation of the Ghanaian citizenship. That's when you look at section 17 of the act, where okay. it's when someone gets married in a and um, by virtue of that marriage, that the person is supposed to renounce their citizenship once the, that marriage is not holding any any longer. The the person the the person then gets um, what you call the Ghanaian citizenship back. So if you look at section seventeen two, it answers the question that he was saying. Right. 
Uh, Ajo, please, are you there? Oh, if not, okay, let me. Uh, you can mute yourself again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, if I understand you, you don't necessarily agree that the answer is D, but you are just trying to uh, uh, put the contribution of division in context. Having regards to section 17, is that not your position? Okay, I think I was there. Uh, okay, I think we should be winding up on this and move on. At least the most important thing is that we know what the legal position is concerning uh, when citizenship can be uh, deprived or can be revoked. And section 18 is quite clear that if your citizenship by birth or adoption, then that cannot be uh, you know, taken away from you. So we, we don't need to, okay, let me listen. Okay, let me listen. Yeah, Ajo, is your hand still up? Ajo, is your hand up? No, Prof, it's right. the old. Right. Uh, where is that? Yes, Doc. Mm. I also think that uh, we should hold the question to be correct as it is, okay. and the answer should be uh, the, the, the D. Uh, okay. and the, the, the reading of Article uh, Section 17.2. Because the question said that, which is, yes, 17.2 of the Citizenship Act. Okay. I think that's where the examiner set the question around. And if we analyze it well, it should answer this question. Okay. So where, let, let's read it. Where the law of a country, oh, so where the law of a country requires a person who marries a citizen of that country to renounce the citizenship of his own country by virtue of that marriage. A citizen of Ghana who is deprived of his citizenship by virtue of that marriage, uh, on the dissolution of that marriage, become a citizen of Ghana. So uh, how do you use that to justify your, your position? It's only talking about the fact that if- Doc, so if you look at that- If you marry someone, no, let's say that if you, uh, you, you Section uh, 17.2 is talking about the fact that where you've married uh, uh, someone uh, other than Ghanaian, and the law of that particular country, for example, required that you have to give up your previous uh, uh, citizenship so that you can enjoy the citizenship of your wife or your husband by virtue of the marriage. Now, our law is being sympathetic to you that you're following the promptings of your heart. So our law doesn't want you to lose the, the love uh, of your life. So we will allow you, uh, just you can put the Ghanaian citizenship there if that is what is required before you can actually marry the person, enjoy the citizenship and all that, no problem. However, uh, should uh, the marriage end or whatever and later on you want to come back, we allow you to have your Ghanaian citizenship back. That is my understanding of session. 17 to so it's like a, a, a saving grace for Ghanaians who through no choice of this, but by compulsion of the maybe marriage, uh, you know, condition or requirement, if they happen to marry somebody who is not a Ghanaian or in another country and they want to have the citizenship over there, then he's losing uh, his Ghanaian citizenship and not necessarily because he has made like a free uh, act or a free wish to really renounce it. But that is the relevance of section 17 too. And for that matter, when we are talking about deprivation of citizenship, the controlling provision is section 18. Okay, let's move on. Uh, 32, consent of claimant is defense of strict liabilities, strict liability thoughts in the same way as it is to intentional thoughts and negligence, uh, true or false. Yeah, so Clement here refers like the, uh, the, the plaintiff, that if the plaintiff, that is the victim of the tort visa, uh, consented to a straight uh, liability uh, thought, is not uh, different from uh, where the plaintiff has also consented to uh, intentional uh, 
Uh, it's so first and foremost, can we say that I have seen once? Okay, uh, Hubert. Hubert. Okay, right. The sound was a mistake. Uh, David, your hand up. Okay, all right. Uh, we have a knee. knee. Yeah, look. No. Please, uh, what is strict liability thought? I know uh, strict liability is criminal. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I honestly find it a bit strange too. Otherwise, if you are talking about me like trespass to person, right? Uh, but even trespass to person, like battery and also, is like if you you have committed a battery or assault, your motive, your intention is not important. Uh, but of course, uh, as you rightly said, uh, street liability is often understood in the context of uh, men's right and artist rules that uh, those criminal offenses, uh, which does not require distinct men's right. And then uh, the men's right is uh, taken to have it subsumed in the practice rules. That is where you ban the, the prohibited the, uh, acts. Then you are taken to have committed the, that uh, offense. That is the usual uh, context in which the strict uh, liability is used. Nevertheless, I have my street, uh, my black uh, law this night here. So just to out of abundance of uh, caution, we will look at it and then we will conclude uh, on it. Okay, so if you look at the Black Law Additional, uh, those who have my edition, that is the 11th edition, uh, page 17, uh, 19. Uh, maybe, by the way, uh, because we are all in the legal fraternity, uh, let's observe uh, uh, 10 seconds uh, silence in memory of the venerable member of the Supreme Court, that is Ma Fusau, who unfortunately died uh, today. Jesus Christ. So uh, the soul of Justice Ma Fusai and all the faithful departed through the mercies of God rest in peace. Yeah, so I'll continue to urge you to be serious about the COVID-19 protocol because uh, what we know is that uh, his death is in relation to COVID-19, despite the fact that he has taken like the two, uh, the two shots. So with, what it means is that we, we, we still have to be very careful. So having said that, uh, let's come back to the last law decision in trying to uh, resolve the conundrum as whether there's anything called straight liability thoughts uh, and not only straight liability uh, offense. Uh, so, yeah, I've seen Jamila, Jamila, let me read the, the provision from Black Law this now and then you come in, okay? Just one second. Yeah, so if you look at the uh, uh, page 17 and 10, uh, over there we have a strict liability, and they say CC liability, and then we have like the strict liability crime, right? And then straight liability uh, offense. So uh, the, the, the usual uh, reference is straight liability crime or uh, straight liability uh, offense, but it has referred us back to liability. So let's go there and see whether uh, we'll get any assistance with respect to straight liability uh, thought. Okay, so if you go to uh, strict liability at page 1099, it says, and I quote, liability that does not depend on proof of negligence or intent to do harm, but that is based instead on a duty to compensate the harms proximately caused by the activity or behavior subject to the liability rule. Prominent example of strict liability involve the rules govern abnormally dangerous activities. 
and the commercial distribution of defective uh, products. Also termed liability without fault. Okay. Uh, so see straight products liability, absolute liability for outcome like, uh, responsibility and all that. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, that is the, uh, the clarification. So in that case, uh, of course, I, I, I get the point. So if you take like animals, for example, right? If you take animals, uh, dangerous animals, you leave, let's say that uh, you are dogs unattended. They just go and bite uh, someone. That you, you, it doesn't matter. Uh, or you leave, uh, let's say, you uh -huh. are any, but, but of course, that one can also be your animals, like let's say your cattle. Uh, cattle, for example, they go and to another uh, land or defecate there. But arguably, um, uh, it, it's because we can still treat it as a, a, a one form of a, uh, either uh, trespass or an aspect of a, a nuisance, uh, as it were. Or even depending upon uh, the context, we can even have like a negligence uh, over there. But, but anyway, let's, uh, yes. I saw, uh, Jamila, have you put your hand down? Okay, Jamila is gone. So if Jamila is gone, then let me take, uh, uh, I think Tommy, is it Tom or, yeah, Tommy, and then after Tommy, uh, Tommy, is your hand up? It's gone. Okay, then let's take it. Yes, yes, Doc. Okay, after, Doc, my hand is up. Okay, you have to me then. Right. So, Doc, uh, I, I don't know, but I personally think uh, uh, you don't have anything for uh, this like but I think the examiner would want us to know that uh, was bringing in the thought for us to know that it's a legal wrong with a strict like so uh, it's not necessarily like we have a, a doctrine or principle called this uh, liability tort. But if you look at that particular tort and the other form of intentional tort, which doesn't have strict liability, then we can really look at it in that light. So I personally think it is in the light of the fact that the examiner would want to be let us know that he's looking at the legal wrong with six rights and the legal wrong which is insane. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, Hubert. Hubert, you have your turn now. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the rule in Rylands and Fletcher is still a strict liability tort. Then I think conversion is also. Uh, a strict liability tort. So we said that uh, strict liability um, torts as it stands now. So it's not like it has been done away with. At least there are arguments saying that we shouldn't have any tort as this thing, as a strict liability tort. But then the rule in Rylands and Fletcher, as well as conversion, has survived that argument. So we still have Rylands and Fletcher, then conversion as strict liability. And I think per Rylands and Fletcher, consent can be a defense. Consent can be a defense under um, Rylands and Fletcher. Then the answer is true. Is true. So that's that's my opinion. Okay. Uh, okay so uh, is it Francis? Okay, let me tell Francis. Francis. Yes, please. I think I have, yes, I cannot agree more with um, the, the last speaker because he has spoken my mind uh, to the fact that uh, the rule in Ryland and Fletcher is a strict liability because it does not require any intent, uh, uh, any fault on the part of the, of the, uh, of the third visa. And so it's a strict liability. And then um, the defense he refers to uh, is, is, is a defense, not that it can be a defense where there is a consent, sorry. Consent is a defense, not that it can be a defense, where probably the adjoining landowner consents to whatever has been brought onto the land, then he cannot uh, uh, make any claim if there's an escape which causes him harm. 
Right. Uh, the one about the conversion. I think you better have spoken to that. I, I honestly, I have little understanding of that. Okay, all right. But let's say the ruling Rollins and Fletcher, let's suppose that uh, you brought uh, other hands. Okay, yeah, uh, who will just be there? Let's suppose that uh, you set up, maybe you run like a, a water system, right? On your land, maybe like some plumber set up and things like that. And maybe uh, the plumbers, they didn't do it well. And there was a, a breakdown and water rush to your neighbor's rooms and things like that, or their, their next houses. So Ulu argued that uh, because you had gone to inform them that we're coming to set up uh, that water system over there. If anything went wrong and then there was an uh, escape, right? And got onto their land, uh, then uh, that is how the consent will work. Or how do you uh, contextualize the consent in that respect? Yes, Hubert. Um, I think the consent works this way. If you went to them and you tell them that I am going to accumulate this amount of water in my land, then most definitely if they say you can you have you can go ahead, or even if they participate in it, then if it so happens that the water escapes then, and damage to their property, then their consent will operate as a defense against them. So I think that's how the consent works. So as in the case of a kennel against uh, something business property. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we've, we've resolved that. So uh, if uh, that is uh, our consensus, and it's also uh, consistent with the, some uh, old case law, uh, Kedel against the city business. Let me put it there uh, for you. Kedel against city business. What is Okay. Uh, Francis, is your hand up? Oh, sir, I, I think it's a mistake in the previous reaction, sir. Okay, let's go 33. Uh, dash, it was established that where the occupier admits people to his premises for a fee, he must provide a warranty for the safety of his premises, which is the duty he owes to visitors, including contractors. Okay, so testing our knowledge of the case law in relation to Occupy's liability. Uh, and I think that yesterday, was it yesterday that we discussed the case of the Francis and Coco was quite uh, prominent. Okay, so let's start. Uh, Taylor and Glasgow, what did Taylor and Glasgow decide? Let's uh, go through all the case before we, we answer the question. What did Taylor and Glasgow decide? Uh, you are learning uh, law at really beautiful time. You can just Google and then uh, get to the law website and then you have the authorities. Mm. 
Yeah, okay, so from, uh, since nobody is telling me, Yeah, Taylor and uh, against Glasgow uh, Corporation. And can read all oh, the thing that has to. Yes, okay, we have a. Uh, uh, Ni. Yeah, Ni. Tell us what have you. I think it's about, it's about allurement. Yes, so. Allurement. Okay, so what happened? The, no, there was, there was this, I think there was a, a shrub or something that allured a child to the place. Yeah, some berries. Okay. Yeah. And then what happened? I went through. And the child, the, I think the, the court says that once the, the occupier knows that uh, that thing will all normally attach children to the place, you should have to have it. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, okay, that is fine. So just like if you have like a oranges, uh, you have oranges, ripe oranges, uh, just behind your backyard. And let's suppose that uh, under the orange tree, let's suppose, you have a, a hole there and you have some bush, like a bit of like maybe bushes on it. Somebody will step on it without knowing that there's a, a hole or something like that there. And then the person, uh, you know, gets stuck and gets injured. Okay, now let's move on to Francis and uh, of, uh, Cocker. Of course, when I have dismissed uh, Tilling uh, Glasgow, because Tilling Glasgow, it it was not, not it was not like uh, the visitors were came there under contractual arrangement. If you like, the person was more or less on the floric uh, of his own, so to speak. But the only difference was that the court was saying that if you have something which naturally will appeal to younger person, then you bear uh, a responsibility to ensure that uh, they are safe when they are so attracted. Yes, Francis and the cockerel. Uh, that case is well known here. Yeah, who will remind us? Francis and uh, Cocker, what was decided there? Are you sleeping? Francis and Cocker. Last, was it three days ago when we were dis discussing the occupants liability? I think the, we discussed that case. Uh, the ladies were actually in the lead in discussing. Yes, Francis. Yes, sir. So, like you said, I think some few days ago, the ladies helped us. So I went back and referred to the case and it's in reference to premises. That when it comes to premises, there is an implied warranty that the owner of the premises uh, uh, will keep the place safe for uh, any lawful entrance, any lawful entrance or any invitee who is uh, uh, lawfully brought onto the premises. There's an implied warranty that the place is safe for the purpose for which uh, um, 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 the contract is made. Yeah, so the uh, the plaintiff, okay, uh, the plaintiff, FJ, who is FJ? Have you given up? Okay, FJ. Go ahead. FJ, go ahead. Yes. Um, yes, sir, please, I, I agree with the speaker. Okay, so the yeah. plaintiff got uh, injured. Injured, yeah. But what I like for the fact that for a seat uh, in which he had paid, that is very important. That is consistent with what the person is trying to tell us. You see, he was not just ordinarily... Uh, 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 invitee, but okay. he had paid for the seat. So the plaintiff was injured by the fall of a stand on the race course for a seat in which he had paid. And the defendant was part pro uh, proprietor of the stand and acted as receiver of the money. So the stand had been neg negligently erected by a contractor, though the defendant was not aware of the defect. 
And so that, so that was, uh, I think, uh, important. Okay. So uh, let's go on to wheat against uh, Lacan. So now we know uh, that uh, uh, Francis against uh, Cochrane is, is uh, what will fit uh, very well for the time being. But let's test the correctness of it against C and D. So we could say Francis and Cochrane decided that uh, where the occupier admits support is supremacy for fee, just like what happened in Francis and Cochrane. He must provide a warranty for the safety of his permit, which is a duty he owes to visit, including contractors. Okay, but let's, before we dismiss uh, uh, yeah. against Lacon and then uh, Lowry and Walker, will somebody tell us what happened in which against uh, Yi uh, Lacon? Uh, FJ, you still want to help us? Uh, which against Yi Lacon? Uh, okay, so. FJ, I have released you. Yes, I've released you, FJ. You can mute yourself. Okay, Sam. So, um, the court held that uh, Larkon were occupiers for the purpose of occupiers liability. So it doesn't speak to the question. It doesn't speak to the question. No. What was uh, decided? Okay. Well, what I, okay, so let's say a uh, barista and then me. Yeah, uh, the learning from Wheat and La Connaughting. It is an authority for, I mean, the definition of the who an occupier is. That was why Lord Denin uh, defined an occupier as a person who had a sufficient degree of control over premises. So it's more of like an authority for deciding who an occupier is for defining an occupier. Okay, all right. Uh, then uh, Lowry and Walker. Uh, Larry Walker, uh, Ni. Okay, it's gone. Uh, okay, Hubert. Um, so, um, the, in this case, is it that the defendant had a piece of land and um, the plaintiff was using the piece of land or the land and was injured by a horse and um. Also, members of the public has, has been using the field as a shortcut for quite a number of years. So it was felt that the defendant was liable, not because um, the plaintiff had an express consent to enter or to use the land as a shortcut, but because of um, an implied license for, for the fact that members of the public had been using the field as a shortcut. So there was an implied license to enter the premise because of the defendant's acquiescence in the use of the field as a shortcut. So uh, it's established that um, it was only in relation to implied license by reason of acquiescence. Okay, so therefore, uh, having looked at all the case law, uh, B uh, will be the most uh, suitable authority for the proposition, which is uh, uh, stated in question 33. Okay, now we have the, we are done with the MCQ. We have the problem uh, based question to try. Since uh, you have the copies, uh, let me yes. suggest that uh, you go and try your hands on them so that if we should come back to this, uh, you'll be able to uh, do that. But I think that uh, uh, I am more attracted to question two. And it's something that we have to pay attention to. Not exactly the wording, but the, 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 the concept behind. That is, the, because as we speak now, there's uh, even an ongoing uh, project that we are doing, collection of uh, book chapters, trying to review the workings of the constitution since it came into force and all that. So 
uh, it is not out of place. If uh, your examiner was constitutionally minded to invite us to, for example, uh, evaluate, right, the constitution of Ghana and its workings and point out or identify and explain areas which are problematic, for which reason we would like to see reform so as to consolidate our constitutional democratic governance and so on and so forth. So I think that is a good question, but uh, this question you can benefit if you glance your eyes through the Constitutional Review Commission report and then the, the white paper. And of course, some of the current uh, debates uh, which have been going on, there are a number of, of uh, areas which have been a bit like the uh, problematic. So uh, we start from the a number of a number of like areas. Was I mean even if we start from like the subsidiary like legislation itself, uh, that is uh, you see some problems there and the the the, the case law that we've referred to, to recently, and then you go to of course for citizenship most of the areas have been worked out uh, quite uh, clearly. But then you move on and you come, let's say, um, when it comes to territory, like the, you know, the, the territories of Ghana, do we really have any problem? Well, if you go to the Constitutional Review Commission report, you find all that there is, one, but they, they, now we've, we have new regions, right? We have, about, uh, we have all together 16 regions and all that and so on and so forth. So that is not so much uh, a problem. But then we come to the decentralization, right? You go to decentralization uh, of governance. That is where we have like a, a big problem, especially uh, the fact that we wanted to make position of this chief executive and then the metropolitan municipal uh, chief executive an elective position rather than the current uh, uh, you know, uh, appointive one by the, the government of the day. And so, but if you go to the Constitutional Review Commission, I'll push the report to you. Yeah, I think I have PDF. Uh, if you run your eyes through, you get uh, very good uh, points to uh, buttress all those matters. And again, uh, come back to the issue of the chief tenancy. So chief, they are allowed to do active politics. That issue is still back and forth. And if you take the Asantehne, uh, His Majesty Otun Force to the second. We remember that uh, he has also waded into that debate. I, I do not think whether when he was celebrating one of his uh, anniversary, he made like a big speech or one of those public speeches. A number of uh, chiefs, you know, have also expressed their concerns. We have like a divided uh, view as whether well chiefs should be allowed to do uh, active partisan politics or they should just remain as they are and so on. So that is uh, another area that uh, we need to look at. And of course, when it comes to Supreme Court, right? The composition of the Supreme Court, we don't have any capping of the Supreme Court. We only have like the, the minimum that the Supreme Court uh, as in the minimum of uh, nine judges and so on and so forth, but there's no capping. So as it is now, if any government of the day come, you can appoint as many as you want and so on. And that is also problematic for us as a country. So if we look at the Constitutional Review Commission report, we have uh, some suggested solution uh, to that. And again, uh, of course, now the, the controversial issue of the first ladies, that the first ladies uh, do not, for example, have recognized constitutional rule, but in reality, they perform uh, no, not constitutional, they perform some important uh, roles in support of their husbands who are, are the head of the executive, the, the, the president and so on. So should we, for example, if should we give them a recognized constitutional role and so on? Yeah, so all these are interesting matters which uh, one could look uh, into. And then another big problem has to do with the appointment of uh, ministers. The constitution says that majority of ministers will come from parliament. 
and that affects the effectiveness of the parliamentary work. So uh, it's something that we need to also look at if we are going to amend our constitution, that uh, we, we will need to probably remove that clause that the majority and probably simply say either one third or whatever should come from uh, parliament so that it does not affect the working of the parliament. And also, should you get a hand uh, parliament or if you get like a, a very uh, equally balanced uh, parliament like we have now, and know that and <clears throat> we are in a society where uh, the so-called the winner uh, takes all has become the order of the day, how it will affect the workings of government and all that. So I think these are some of the things that uh, we have to be uh, thinking about. I've not exhausted anything. I've only used a broad brush approach just to map out some of the things that we need to. But I, I, I see question two as a, a question, uh, even if not the same wording, the sense of it can be a good candidate for your examination. Uh, so it will not be a waste of time if you decided to uh, spend a bit of time or a little bit of energy around that. Okay, so I'll just take uh, not more than five more interventions and then we end the class and we'll continue tomorrow. So uh, if you want to speak or comment, I'll give preference, especially those who have not spoken at all, maximum five and then you end. So just raise up your hand and then I'll allow you to speak. especially those who have not spoken. Okay, so let me see. Uh, okay, let's start from uh, Isaac Majid. I haven't heard your voice tonight. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, I just want to um, make some little comments in relation to things that you, you, you expose that we need to, you know, look at it in terms of amendment in the constitution. Okay. Yes, in respect to Chief Tennessee asked in the uh, 270, I believe strongly that um, our history as Ghanaians and Africans, I support the view that chiefs shouldn't take part in active politics. If they veered into active politics, the respect that when we have, you know, that we attach to a traditional institution is likely to diminish. So in my view, some ex I don't think that they should veer in. In relation to uh, appointment of majority of members of parliament from parliament. I believe strongly that we we, we, we learn it from the Bujia regime. Um, Bujia government was overthrown because he couldn't get most of his things passed in parliament. So I believe that, that in the thinking of those drafters that drafted the 1992 constitution, they didn't want history to repeat itself. So that maybe a government might struggle to get his things through parliament. I believe that as our democracy have matured, God forbid, I don't think a coup can happen in Ghana here. As our democracy have matured, they can look at that provision and also take majority of parliament and as in majority of the so-called appointees out. In relation to uh, local government, for some of us, we advocated that we believe strongly that if um, DCs were voted to some extent, it will help in the process. But I remember I once attended a lecture in which uh, Kwame Ahoy, Kwame Ahoy is seen as uh, he's a, a doyen of local government in Ghana. Then he made certain points. Then he made some of us understand that we don't seem to know what we are talking about. But we can give it a trial, then see what is going to happen. Some people are of the opinion that if we allow our local people to vote our DCs, that it could be an avenue for them to sabotage the government, especially if it is not their government that is in power. So my, my response to them is that no, if only those people even attempt to sabotage the government, they, they are giving us an indication that we should not even vote for them, for them to even come at all. Because if you're in opposition, then you are sabotaging our process. Then that one, it will even sort of like mad hey. the chance of even right. being voted. All right, Isaka, thank you very much. So at least uh, you've started the... Uh, uh, May, uh, broadening the, the discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So let's take uh, the, the second person, then we'll have three more. Uh, so Samuel Osei Bunsu. 
I would like to hear the ladies too. The ladies, I heard only one person tonight. So let me get two or three more ladies to raise up their hand. Yes, Samuel. Doc, good evening. Good evening. It's a clarification that I want. Um, I think I heard um, one speaker saying that Rylance and Fletcher is a strict liability. I don't know whether the law has been changed, but I think I read somewhere in Cambridge, Cambridge Waterworks versus Eastern Counties. Cambridge Waterworks versus Eastern Counties. Cambridge. Yes, Cambridge. whereby um, the, the decision was to the effect that uh, foreseeability is now required. So I don't know whether that position has been changed. And the speaker, the earlier speaker, um, was trying okay. to say. Let me get the thoughts again. Cambridge Waterways versus what? Eastern counties. Right. Eastern counties led down. I think they were storing a chemical. Yes. They were storing a chemical, and the chemical, um, like, contaminated the Kiliman's water, and they sued them, and the court held that possibility was required. It's no longer straight liability. But I don't know whether that position has been changed. So I want him to clarify it for me, or if you can clarify it for me. OK. And my second question, which is the last question. I think um, the la uh, from the OBD, the one in relation to uh, occupiers liability, whereby we say, uh, you, you said, the question was trying to say that there is an implied warranty which um, the occupier must try to abide. I don't know whether that one is in relation to contractual pesetes or it also relates to invitees. Yeah, which is which? The, the cochlear case, I think, uh, is in relation to contractual pesetes uh, uh, because, like, I think the the person had paid for the seat. And I, and I think that was uh, an aspect of the material facts which uh, drove uh, that decision uh, as uh, it were. Yeah, but I will let uh, uh, Hubert react to your first uh, question based upon the uh, Cambridge water works against the Eastern Candies like that limited. Yes, uh, Hubert. Um, yes, sir. Um... I'll have to read the case and maybe in our subsequent meetings, I'll, I would respond to that. But I've not averted my mind to that decision. So I can't make a case on it. Okay, so the, uh, the, the material I have with me, the material I have with me, uh, which uh, just a portion of it, I can I think that we can just quickly uh, read. That in terms of like the, what that case, the significance of that case that, uh, uh, if we, I mean, uh, I mean, Lord Goff uh, was in that case, and then the the commentators makes the point that uh, Lord Goff uh, made important uh, changes to the law. So first of all, that we are told that the first which imposed a requirement for self to cases of violence and flesh. So, and which, 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 which is to the fact that it must be shown that the defendant has done something which he recognized or judged by the standards appropriate at the relevant place or time, or what reasonably to have recognized as giving rise to an exceptionally high risk of danger or mischief if there should be an escape, however unlikely an escape may have been thought to be. Secondly, it was a fair decision to state that Rollins and Fletcher may be a subset of nuisance and as such, apply the same requirement of foreseeability of harm to nuisance, where previously such a requirement had not uh, existed. Now, of course, uh, commentators, you know, you know, it is true that the foreseeability aspect was brought, but uh, I wouldn't uh, say without a further uh, check that that has come to uh, forever change the law in that respect. Because uh, what uh, 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 Lord Gov uh, 
suggested has been subject of uh, important uh, uh, critique. So it is, uh, I think, a very interesting point which I've raised. And I think at, the, at our next uh, class, we can spend uh, maybe some 10 minutes or whatever trying to revisit this particular issue. So Isaka, uh, thank you for bringing it up. So we yes, will look uh, at it again. Okay. Yes, so, sir, this Francis. Yeah, Francis. Yes, Francis. No, I think Isaka was the one or he wrote, who, who raised the issue that I'm uh, addressing all. Uh, uh, yes, I'm trying to speak to the uh, ruin uh, Ryland and Fletcher issue. Okay, you want to add your, yeah, all right, all right, all right, please go ahead. Yes. Exactly. So you see the case, uh, you, uh, case that you have seen uh, sent to us on the page uh, yes. seems to be the, the full case, which uh, some of us have, have adverted our mind to. And so if you study the history of Ryland and Fletcher, I think from the onset, there was no liability uh, on, on the part of, of the defendants at uh, Exchaka Court 1. And the reason was that there was, there was no fault on their part. There was no fault on their part. And therefore, you could not impute liability to them. And then when the case was appealed to Exchaka Court 2, then there, Justice uh, 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 Blackburn also um, ruled in favor of the plaintiff that if, and then examples were cited that if you should have animals and you release your animals or by uh, either, whether by fault of yours or not, your animals get out there and they went to consume somebody's uh, crops, shouldn't you be made liable for that? You should be made liable for that. So it became a, a thought of, uh, a, a thought of, of fault. But from the beginning, there was no fault. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, sorry, from the beginning, it was a thought of fault that we should look at the issue of fault, whether the defendant was at fault or not. It was based on that, that there was no liability imputed to them. And I think at the, at the exchequer where a black men came in, then he says that fault is not of, a, it is not of importance. Fault is not of importance, whether it is by your fault or not. If your animal should get out and they consume somebody's crops, you should bear liability for that one. And so that is where street liability came in. So that the rule in Ryland and Fletcher became a street liability, a thought of street liability. And this was what was affirmed by the House of Lords. All right. Which still you. remain as it is today. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, so we take uh, two more and then we are done. But I want to give preference to ladies who have not spoken. So we can get the two ladies to be contributing. So there is a balanced discussion. Okay, Zoom. Yes, please go ahead. Hello. Okay. Uh, I think the person is talking, but I cannot hear. I don't know if you can hear. Uh, the person talking, and then the person is not heard. So let's zoom user. Are you you've been released? Are you talking? I cannot hear yeah. anything. Okay, then let me go to uh, barrister. Hello. Yeah. Barrister. Hello. Oh, sorry, no, uh, it is accidental. Sorry. Right, no problem. Okay, then uh, I think all of you, uh, Hubert, is your hand still up? Okay. Is your hand no. still up? All right. Okay, so yes. thank you very much for coming and then uh, yes. have a very good night. Uh, good. Okay. I think, uh, no, the lady has come. FJ, yes. FJ. Um. Yeah. Yeah, dog. Um, please. So I want clarification for the strict strict liability associating to negligence because the submission was like it's true, but now with the Cambridge, uh, the case, the other yeah, guys. So I think the what we resolved was that uh, we will come back to that aspect and have uh, some 10 minutes discussion as a prelude to our next class, okay? 
Yeah, so we, we, we come back to uh, all of you, you are going to read the Cambridge case. And when we come, then we, we take it from there. Uh, Ajo. Okay, so Ajo will be the last speaker. Yes, Ajo, please go ahead. Ajo, your hand is up. Yes, go ahead. Um, Doc, there was a question and a be asked. Um, I can't seem to find it on the on the page anymore. And maybe if you're online, could you please send the question to Prof so he can answer it for us? It had to, it, it's in regards to um, CJ's removal and oh, something. Right. Oh, okay. All right. And okay. So we will we'll discuss that. Uh, is that if your committee considering that one forces, is that it? Miss Miss the inquiry and advise the president to remove the chief justice uh, or superior. Uh, of course, uh, superior uh, justice of a superior court. Can the justice or the chief justice approve? Is that the question? Uh, Ajo, is that the question? Oh, she's gone. Uh, is that the question you meant? Uh, yes, Saint Mugai. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, my, mine is actually a question, but a contribution. Uh, today marks exactly two weeks for our exam. So I am suggesting that if on the page we can have a simplified form of format to follow in order to, because now we seem to be very conversant with the, the content but the approach as to how to present our answers to end the maximum marks. So that you take one topic or a problem question, then not, not the answers, but the details. This is what we have to do in order to gain the marks. I think that one also contributes to a very large extent in our preparations. Okay, thank you very much. We will, we will do that. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, FG. I'm here again. Yeah, she's gone. Uh, FJ, I think she's gone. So we have to close. So thank you very much. Have a good night.